Hey everyone, welcome to Midweek for a time of devotion and encouragement. My name is Don Conley and I just want to welcome you to Ringo Church and as we study the book of Revelation together, uh, as we get started today, why don't we just go ahead and invite some others to join us for a time of study on God's word and encouragement. So if you would just go ahead and hit the share button right now and let's share some hope and truth today with others. Today we're beginning to kind of work our way through the book of Revelation. We spent some time uh, with chapters 2, 3, and 4, looking at the seven churches of Revelation. But now what we want to do is we kind of want to look at the rest of the book of Revelation. And we're going to kind of look at this in two pieces here. We'll be in this uh, first part here for a couple of weeks, and then uh, we'll go into the next part of the book of Revelation, and we'll kind of dig into this. And there's just so much information to kind of work our way through. So it'll take us a few weeks to do that. So I, I think, in, you know, we live in such a time, this is a good time. Uh, to be studying the book of Revelation, uh, just to be reminded of the truth of God's word, what Jesus has to say to us as Christians, the church. Uh, but when you study through the book of Revelation, man, it can be overwhelming. There are so many interpretations of this book. There is so much that we could go through, so many different paths that we could go down, that we could take. Yet, I want us to be careful as we study this book together. I don't want us to miss the whole point of what the book of Revelation is about. I don't want us to miss the main message of Revelation because we get lost. You see, we can all get lost in all these different rabbit trails that we are tempted to take as we study the book of Revelation. Uh, there's all these things that we can get caught up in speculating and guessing. And, and you know, sometimes we plant our flag in some of these things and it's really not that clear. Sometimes it is clear, but we try to make it out more than what it really says versus just taking the context of what it does say. So we're going to take a tour through one of the great books of the Bible called Revelation. So uh, we're going to look at the whole story. We want to see all of it, but there's a temptation to stop. And, you know, it's just like when you're out traveling, you know, uh, the Grand Canyon. You could get caught on something that looks so neat that you've missed the whole picture, you know. So... There's the temptation, I think, to study the book of Revelation is to kind of stop at different places and different pieces of it, especially, I guess, to speak to us that, you know, kind of intrigue us. And uh, I've, I've kind of adopted a popular phrase uh, among tour guides, you know, and you ever been with a tour guide and they're, you know, you know you're, you're on this tour of this place, it's just amazing. And you just want to keep taking it in, keep taking it in. And the next thing you hear the tour guide saying, we're walking we're walking. And what that means is, is we got to go. We got to get through this, people. We got to keep moving. We can't just stay right here. So as we go through Revelation, I want to kind of call on my experience as a tour guide to keep us moving. Because what I don't want us to do is to get so caught up in staring at one thing or some obscure question or some unique interpretation that we miss the whole point of what the passage of Scripture is saying, that we miss the message of Revelation. So we're going to be moving as we go through Revelation. Even though it's stressed out over several weeks, we're going to kind of quickly move through this uh, as we kind of look at all this material. We're going to take it in. We're going to keep moving. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. That's where we're going to start. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So notice the word soon. It says soon. It's, it's going to be a word that we're going to come back to a number of times in this series. John, now remember, John is a disciple, an apostle. Uh, he's really the real tour guide here that takes us. John kind of takes us through Revelation. So John is one of the disciples of Jesus. He also wrote the Gospel of John. He was exiled. Remember, John was exiled to this island uh, that's called Patmos. It was about 10 miles long, about 6 miles wide, and it was in the Aegean Sea. Now, the Roman government saw John as a threat, so they exiled him to this island. Now, he is the only one of the disciples that was not, um, he wasn't a martyr. He wasn't killed for following Jesus, the only one. The Roman government had learned that, you know, this martyrdom had the opposite effect. So, you know, they, they were trying to kill the disciples to kill the movement of the church, you know, the gospel. And that was not the effect that they were getting. The gospel was continuing to spread. So they thought, well, let's do something different. Because whenever, whenever the government, the Roman government would kill one of the disciples of Jesus, the church would grow all the more. 
So they saw John as a great threat, which is intriguing enough because at this point in time, he's 90 years old. I mean, so can you imagine like John's got a walker and he's got dentures and they're like, he's a threat. Let's, let's get him to the island. Let's, let's put him basically in jail, you know, far away, you know, like solitary confinement. So they send him to this island called Patmos, presumably send him, send him there to die. And it's on this island that John is given this vision where he now shares it with us and, and what this letter is, the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 2. Who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Now, there is the word at the end of that passage, the word near. So you, you have the word soon in verse 1, and in verse 3, we have the word near. So I want you to catch this. There's a promise of a blessing here. It says, for those who read this book, Revelation, read these words, those who hear these words, for those who take it to heart, what is written in the Word of God, in Revelation. This is, this is not a great translation that we have here in the NIV of this verse. The best word here for take to heart what is written in it is the word obey. So there's a blessing for those who read it and those who hear it and those who obey it. So Revelation is the only book that I know that has this promise of a blessing for just reading it, for just listening, you know, and then letting it overflow in our lives, obeying it, walking in it. This is what we want to do. We want to catch God's blessing for us as we study through the book of Revelation. Now, if you really look at the history of this book being taught in the church, it doesn't always feel like it's been a blessing to the church or to to the church family, you know, to Christians. In fact, many times the book of Revelation and its teaching in the church, it's caused a lot of division and disunity within the church. I was thinking about why this book hasn't been a blessing as Jesus promised it would be. Or what could keep this book, the book of Revelation, from blessing us as a church? And there are a few things. One, Revelation is hard to understand. I mean, it's just difficult in some places when you read through and go, what is that really saying? The church father, uh, Jerome, said, Revelation has many mysteries as it does words. Martin Luther said somewhat fictitiously, the book of Revelation ought to be kicked out of the Bible because it doesn't reveal anything. It's full of bizarre images and strange creatures, he says. There's a beast with ten horns and claws of bronze, and there are stars falling from the heavens. There's a great uh, red dragon with seven heads, and there's a sign of the beast, you know, which is 666. There are bows of sulfur, and there are people who eat scrolls, and there's a bottomless, bottomless pit. There are horses of the apocalypse. Um, it's, you know, the Revelation is just full of all this strange stuff. Now, what our tendency is, is when we come across things that are hard to understand is, our tendency is to turn away from them, run away from them. We want to, you know, but we want to understand them. We, we want to make sense of all this. And when it doesn't make sense, I mean, what happens when you're reading something that doesn't make sense? We tend to go a different direction. And that keeps us from being, you know, um, it keeps it, you know, the book of Revelation from being a blessing. Now, another thing that keeps, I think, the book of Revelation from being a blessing as Jesus wants it to be is number two, Revelation is easily abused. No other book of the Bible has sparked more obsession, more strange teachings, more wild speculation than the book of Revelation. So as we study the book of Revelation, some, some of that will become clear as to why that happens. But when you, have, when you have a book that focuses on signs and symbols and often metaphors, it opens up the door of interpretation. It just does. So people try to interpret signs and symbols, symbols through the lens of their current reality or what they know. And then you end up with some pretty crazy stuff. So if you study popular interpretations of this, you know, like suddenly the locusts in Revelation are the Apache helicopters that are coming out of the sky. And suddenly the beast mentioned is, is actually Microsoft or Apple, according to one article I read. Or the Antichrist becomes Justin Bieber. I mean, I mean, just put in whatever you want. 
This is the problem that we have with Revelation. This is what people have done over the years. They try to find pieces of the puzzle by looking at current surroundings and then trying to sometimes force things you know, to piece together. They think this fits, this must be it. And you end up with some crazy pictures that probably most often God never intended. G.K. Chesterton, 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 well, it's hard to say, Chesterton. He said, through St. John, Though St. John saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. Now, you will just notice that there is this trend towards following teachers and preachers of Revelation or commentators of Revelation. That's a big deal today in our culture. And what these teachers or commentators tend to do is they interpret the the book of Revelation based upon current surroundings, uh, current events, like right now politics or current celebrities. There's a tendency to try to treat the book of Revelation like it's a puzzle to solve or a code to crack. And this is not the point of the book of Revelation. It never was. This is not, this is why it's so important that we realize why we have been given this book. It was not given to us to crack a code or, you know, to figure out the puzzle so that we would somehow fill in all the the blank or fill out the calendar, have all of our questions answered. That's not the reason. So as you study through this, as we go through this together, it is important to remember that whatever interpretation you have of this book, the book of Revelation, it must have made sense to the readers who first received it. So as you would try to interpret Scripture, If you have an interpretation that doesn't allow for the people who received it, I go back, what I'm saying is go back 2,000 years. When they would have received this and they would have began to understand this, um, and we don't kind of interpret it through the same lens they did, then there's something wrong with our interpretation. We first understand how they read it before we can kind of put the context to it, to contextualize it. You see, they would have understood this book of literature much more than we do today. We are not used to all these symbols that are listed in the book of Revelation, some of these signs that are given. All these things are new to us. We have our own understanding. John Ortberg, he gives a great example of this. He says, imagine that you're reading a thousand years from now about something that happened in Chicago. In Chicago, it is important to remember that in 1999, and here's what you read now a thousand years from now. You know, the bull, which once ruled the earth for 72 months, has suffered a mighty fall. At the end of 72 months, the great right horn of the bull, whose number was 23, departed, and so did the great left horn of the bull. Then the third of the horn of the bull, which was pierced in many places and dressed like a woman, that being Dennis Rodman, for those who are following along, likewise departed. Then all the beasts of the earth and the hornets and the timber wolves came in and devoured the flesh of the bull, and the glory of the mighty bull was laid low. Now, some of you, as I read through that, you know exactly what he's talking about there. In fact, you know, how many of you understand that completely right now? A bunch of you do, I'm sure. Now, some of you are going, I have no idea because you don't follow sports. It doesn't make any sense to you because you're not a sports fan. Now, if you were to interpret that to make sense of it, it'd be hard because you're not a follower of sports. You'd be like, okay, the number 23, well, that must be the 23rd month of whatever. And you would interpret that trying to do it based on what you know. But if you do a little history, you would study the context and you know it's not really all that difficult to understand. It makes sense to those of us who were around in 1990s and watched the Bulls play, watched Michael Jordan play, and all the players that they had put together. We know that this is talking about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, and his number was 23. We understand the, the different references because it's referring to a time and a place in which many of us lived. It just automatically pops. The same is true, think about this, the same is true as we study through the book of Revelation. Some things that seem very difficult to us to understand today would have made sense to John's readers when they were reading this from him. 
They were used to using some of the different signs and symbols, different metaphors, uh, the different images that he speaks of because they were being oppressed and persecuted by the Romans. So John is going to write this book but he, ju- but he can't just send it out to the seven churches. It's going to have to be read by Roman guards and soldiers. And they're going to read every word. So he's using different images and symbols and signs as a way to communicate to the church. The church would have understood it as a community, what all these different things meant that John was writing about. Now here's another example of it. Imagine a thousand years from now. From now we're reading an article from 2020. And it said... For instance, the Redskins were destroyed by the Cowboys at FedEx. You would read that and you would think, wait a second. Some Cowboys attacked some Indians at, uh, you know, a FedEx truck, you know, in Washington, D.C., and that happened in 2020? That seems crazy. Yeah. But if you're here now and you understand what those images mean, you understand what the language is all about. So what I'm saying is, is we read through the book of Revelation together. It just requires us to be intentional about understanding the context and the history. And, you know, a lot of people do this. You know, they they misinterpret, they miss the context of the whole book. They just take the book of Revelation, they open it up like they would a newspaper, and they kind of set out a calendar and they try to crack the code. You know, they try to just pick pieces of articles they want to read and put it all together. And that's not how it works. The people who read this you know, need to be able to take the context of the whole book. That's what the people who did 2,000 years ago who read this, they would have understood that. For example, horns are almost always a sign and a symbol of kings and kingdoms. So they would have understood things that, you know, that 12, um, and it multiplies like 144 represents or symbolizes the people of God. Um, that 10, and, it's, and, and it, as it's kind of multiplied, it's multiples like 1,000. Represent and symbolize complete amounts of often, you know, a fulfillment of time. That seven represents perfection or completion. And so as we read through some of these things, we need to understand that they would have understood in reading it. Um, it would have made sense to them where maybe for us it's more difficult because we don't put two and two together. That's what we're going to try to do. Context of it. There are 404 verses in Revelation. In those 404 verses, the Old Testament is referenced over 500 times. So it is important to know our history. Eugene Peterson, uh, he wrote the message, and he, he, he says it so well when he describes Revelation. He says, there is not anything in the 66th book of the Bible that is not found in the previous 65. Wow. So we need to be able to put all of it together. It doesn't stand alone. The Bible works together like a perfectly fit glove. Context means everything as we read through the book of Revelation. Why is this so important? Studying through the book of Revelation, because broken lives matter. Really, it's just a reminder of how important to us the gospel is, Jesus, and how the world needs Jesus. And time is short. So broken lives matter. And broken lives are welcome here, welcome in the church. And broken lives are mended by Christ. That's the important thing that you don't want to miss through the book of Revelation. It's really all about Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I look forward to seeing you next week as we continue our study of the book of Revelation. Until then, God bless you. See you next week.